Today we are here for our very first live session with Laura Simons. Hello, Laura. Hello, thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited to be here with you today. Me too. I'm so excited about today's interview. Laura is a hairstylist, salon owner, business coach, mentor, educator, and we are talking all about niching down with intention to find those dream clients and stand out as a beauty professional. So um, Laura is gonna be sharing all this good stuff with us. If you guys are trying to figure out who you are, what makes you unique, how to stand out, and who are those real core amazing clients that you wanna connect with and like how to find them and how to identify them. Laura is sharing all the goods with us. I'm so excited for today. Go ahead, Laura, tell us a little bit about you and your business and what you do. All right, well, hello everybody, and it's so great to meet you. My name is Laura Simmons. I am, I always say first and foremost, a hairstylist because I've been doing hair for 18 years behind the chair. I started as a commission stylist for 17 of those 18 years. And then this last year, I opened up my own salon, which I have a small team and we work out of a salon suite. So I am a salon owner now. And then I also, about three years ago, stepped into mentoring hairstylists as a business coach within their beauty business. Um, and I educate with an extension company. So I have fallen madly in love with our industry and I try and find all different ways that I can serve in different capacities. Um, because I was an extension specialist to begin with as an educator, that's how I niched down my business in the salon. Mm -hmm. And then when it came into pivoting that into business coaching and mentoring, um, it's definitely taken a couple of years of really niching down with who I'm speaking to because even though hairdressers can be a niche in itself, there are such a broad spectrum of stylists oh, out yeah. there. Yeah, so it's been very fun, interesting and challenging to hone that in. And once you really think you have your niche, you probably have more to do with niching down in your niche. Yes, <laughs> so. absolutely. So getting really, really clear and finding the confidence to like put a stake in the ground and say, this is who I am and this is who I'm for. Um, and I'm so excited to chat all about that. First question I wanted to ask you, Laura, is um, one of the big things that you talk about a lot, I see on your Instagram and like a lot of the content you share is building confidence. So why is confidence such an important part of being a business owner, being a beauty professional? And what, where do you think that a lot of hairstylists and beauty pros struggle when it comes to confidence? That's a wonderful question to start with. And it's one thing that I see most stylists struggling with because no matter if you're in the industry for let's just say two to five years or 15 to 25 years, Every time that we're looking to expand ourselves and do something that we're not certain or confident within ourselves to do, it can show within our business. And whether or not you know how to do something really well, to be confident in who you are and your abilities allows you to feel um, unstoppable within expanding your business, within growing your clientele, within niching down, within raising your prices. You have to really be certain about who you are, what you stand for and believe in, what your core values are. And then the big scary unknown on the other side of that fear becomes a little bit, becomes a lot more tangible and a lot less scary, I should say, to really go after that. Um, lacking confidence, and that's something I, I relate to this. This is why I talk about it a lot. Yeah. Lacking confidence is something that we all struggle with. And I think it goes way back to our childhood. It goes back to wanting to be loved and accepted by everybody. And when we, when we lack that part of ourselves, I, I really believe that it shows up in a lot of different ways that we're unaware of. It shows up in how we talk and speak to our friends, how we actually have relationships with our clients behind the chair, and our ability to really, what I call, run a business like a business because we don't feel certain that we're capable or qualified to actually do these things. And yet we see other stylists, especially on Instagram, crushing it. But it's not about comparing yourself to that person. It's about strengthening that confidence muscle. And I believe the only way to grow that and strengthen it is by using it and practicing it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, one thing I always remind myself and I tell other people this because it's been so helpful for me is like confidence doesn't just come to you. You have to work at it and you have to push yourself to do things that you don't quite feel confident about. And only through doing it and overcoming it, are you going to find that confidence? So let's talk about confidence as it comes to our topic for today, which is 
figuring out who you are and figuring out who your dream clients are. Where do you think that people go wrong and how does confidence play a role in that? So finding out the confidence in who you are, I always go back to the simplistic core values of what do you know for certain about yourself? I challenge all of my one-on-one coaching students, all of my groups that I coach, is to write down things you know for certain about yourself. And this can be anything from being, I'm a funny human, I love my hair, I'm good at doing hair, um, I have great taste in clothes, like it can be anything. We focus way too much on what we don't like about ourselves. Mm -hmm. And that's what we are telling ourselves in the subconscious. So we have our subconscious that's typically operating 90, I believe it's about like 98, 95% of the time. And we have a lot of old programming and old stories that that lay in that area that we're not even aware that we're thinking, but they complete, they continuously, excuse me, replay in our minds. And that's how we make a lot of our decisions. And so by reprogramming that, by doing simple affirmations, by writing down things you know for certain about yourself, by strengthening the confidence muscle, allows you to start feeling better about yourself. And then that's going to filter into how you see yourself in the mirror every day. What's the story you tell yourself when you're getting ready to go to work? Um, even to the clothes that you're choosing. Like I always call it like a power stance, a power outfit. Mm-hmm. You want to make sure that you feel good about yeah. what you, how you look when you're even in business or whatever it is you're doing. Because I can't tell you there's been so many times where it's like you take a week off work and I'm actually ready to get back to putting on makeup and dressing normal again because I feel good about myself when yeah. I'm wearing those outfits. So it's making conscious choices in those things. And if for some reason you don't feel good about your body or you don't feel good about the way your aesthetics looks, like give yourself an opportunity to explore what that is, what you can do to strengthen that. And those are going to be simple things that will help you to show up better in your business. And when you feel good about yourself, that's when you want to talk about yourself. I say you're the biggest cheerleader within your business. No one's going to talk about you as much as you talk about you. Yeah. And the only way for you to find your niche and niche down your clientele and really grow your business for the way that you want it to look and feel for yourself is to get really specific on who you're wanting to talk to and have the courage to start talking to that person. Yes. Find where they hang out, um, whether it's social media, whether it's in person, whether it's networking, whatever that may look like, you have to be okay to put yourself out there. And if you don't feel confident about yourself, how are you going to talk to somebody confidently about your business? Yeah, I love that. That's so important. And just like, just so everybody watching this knows, like no matter who you are, there are, there, there are times when you lack the confidence to go up and do scary things. I, you know, I've got insecurities. I lack confidence sometimes. And I usually, my secret thing is I just go out and do it anyway. And then just say afterwards, like, well, that really wasn't that bad. Um, So let's talk about figuring out what makes us unique as business owners and as beauty professionals. So there's competition out there. Let's be honest. Like there in your town, Laura, there are other hairstylists and salons and that kind of thing. So can you tell us your tips and your strategies for really figuring out like how to differentiate yourself from the competition and how to really like figure out who you are that is totally unique from everybody else? So number one is I always say, be, please be you. Like even though I have clients that say, well, I'm weird or I'm different or I'm introverted, use that as your strength. I don't know why being introverted is a negative thing. I don't know why being weird is a negative thing. I think these are all things that create uniqueness and allow everyone to have a different personality because nobody wants to be the same. I don't want you to be me. I want you to be you. Yeah. And I have clients that come that have such creative minds and they think so much differently than I do. And I admire that because I definitely think that I can be very type A. I can have a very systematic approach. It works for me. And that's what makes me magnetic in my way. But for someone else who thinks in a much bigger, more creative, almost like an aerial view, like that, that is your strength. So don't downplay the things that you think are what you would consider normal to yourself because it's really unique to the rest of us because most of us don't think that way. So first and foremost, I tell my clients to really highlight the things that they think 
our negatives, which mm -hmm. are typically what I just mentioned, and play into that. So for instance, if you feel introverted, use that as a marketing tool to reach out to other clients who may also relate to that because they're probably also looking for someone who isn't outspoken and boisterous and loud because they need to find someone who meets them where they're at and you yes. are that person for them. So that's my number one tip. Like you don't be like other people, be who you are and use ways to highlight that. So you do attract the clients you want. And then when it comes to attracting your, your ideal client is getting really specific on who you like to serve. So think about maybe five of your top clients that you currently work with already, or five people that you would love to work with. And then dissect down like what about them do you love? And how can you reach more of those people within your business? Because at the end of the day, I want to go into my job loving every single client that I'm working with. I don't yeah. want to feel dread. I don't want to feel anxiety. I don't want to feel like I have to perform. That's the last thing I want to do. That's a big reason why I went independent was so I could stop performing and I could start being present. That's where the alignment comes into your business. That's when you feel like you don't when I say work a day in your life, which is never going to happen because we always have to do things we don't want to do. That's what gets our business moving forward. However, it is, it's by getting really specific on that. And I'm not just talking about the age and the demographic and where they shop. Those things are important to a degree, but I'm talking about the feeling you get, the energetic pull towards those clients and getting into that mindset of how do you find more of those people? I want to come in the comments and see what everybody else is saying because I'm, I'm seeing some really good comments here. So um, let me just see. Uh, okay, Hannah says, um, I'm shy, kind of a tomboy, introverted, and mystic magic lover like mm. Harry Potter. Those are actually like so, those are really good quirks. Those are awesome. Okay, so let's just say we're talking about wanting to position ourselves on social media. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not saying you're going to go and like put all Harry Potter stuff all over your page, but you totally can. But here's what I would say. I definitely, when doing like posts, for instance, or when you're creating copy for, let's just say a website, like I would highlight the fact that you are kind of shy and that you do love to dress in a certain way. Um, and that your favorite thing is Harry Potter. Like I highlight those things because there's people out there that also love Harry Potter and that yes. prefer to dress more of a tomboy. Um, being shy, in my opinion, means that you have a mystery behind you. There's something about you that is really special and that you only share that with people that you trust and that you can get close with. And as a client, once you build that trust and they start seeing that magic within, I guarantee you have lifelong clients in your chair, or I'm not sure what you do. I'm, I'm assuming you do hair. I think that's a pair of shears or something that you're holding in your picture. Um, but whatever your industry is, Hannah, is you are going to have those lifelong people because they feel that trust with you. And when they feel trusted, they feel heard and they don't want to leave you. Like clients don't want to leave someone that they trust and like, so they're going to grow within your business and whatever direction you take it with a price increase, or if you're pivoting and niching down, they're going to trust the decisions that you make. So this is a really strong suit that I would definitely like lean into because there are more people that are dressing. Let's just say, what's the word I was looking for? I was talking to my husband about this. Um, um, oh my gosh, I'm spacing this word, but there's the fashion within the women's in, within the women's clothing is almost to be a very masculine feel. So it's yeah. not so weird to be a tomboy. Like it's becoming a trend. I almost feel too feminine sometimes. I'm like, well, I want to wear these clothes, but I don't really know if it yeah. fits my vibe yet. So I think you're on the right track. I um, love that. And and I yeah. actually love that you said like the magic within it because I was like, oh, magic, Harry Potter. Like I almost feel like it's, you could use that as like a tagline or something. Um, okay, so thank you for sharing that with us, Hannah, and I love that you love Harry Potter. I'm a huge like sci-fi and um, like sci-fi and fantasy dork, so I, I love that. Okay, Melissa says, I'm highly educated and I sometimes talk over people's heads so that's something Ooh. that melissa kind of like oh am i like talking over people like that kind of thing what would you say about that okay i've actually i would say you've been told that in, in so in less words but i'm wordy if you guys can't tell i love to talk i love to like <laughs> i'm a wordsmith i like reading and i love to educate my clients behind the chair and yes sometimes you can speak over some people's heads so one of two things what you could do is you can learn to read your client and kind of bring it, dial it down a little bit. I'm not saying dim your light, but if you feel that this is just going over their head, you can dial it back just a touch so they can feel more re related and connected to you. 
or you continue to do what lights you up. Because when you're in your element of speaking in this manner that you, because you're highly educated, because that feels good to you, that's authentic to yeah. you, you're going to find your people that want to attract to that. And the people that feel that they're, it's over their head, they're not your people. So you either do kind of like dial it back to meet them where they're at, or you continue to rise and shine and your people will attract them. Yeah, and, to and you. attract people that just like absorb all that info like a sponge. And they're like, oh my gosh, I'm like, Melissa is so good at this stuff. And they might not even like fully understand things, but maybe they're the type of people that like to Google things and learn more. And you're kind of like the catalyst for them doing that. Um, so Adrian says, I'm literally an 87 year old woman stuck in a 24 year old body. I love that. <laughs> she said, I thought my ideal client was my age, but they're actually not. They're older women. Since releasing mm -hmm. my idea of who my ideal client is, I've attracted the best clients ever who just happen to be more mature. Yes, I, I can relate to that too. That's such like a good light bulb moment of talking about that intersection of who we are at a soul level and who are those people who just get us. Let's talk about clientele. So far we've talked about like the internal part and like who we are and who discovering what makes us unique. Let's talk about niching down. So why do so many beauty professionals shy away from niching down or niching down? I know they say in the US and really being intentional about who they're for and who they're not for. Okay. So why people shy away from it? The first mm -hmm. question. Okay. So I feel that people shy away from niching down because they were afraid. It's a scarcity mindset. They're afraid of repelling business and they're not going to find the clients that they really want to work with. So going back to um, when I started doing hair 18 years ago, I did all the hair. And I think that that was part of where the salon was that I was working for, that they were teaching, which I understand. At the same time, it was still this mindset, even as a salon had, is that we do all, you do all. No matter what it is, you're going to say yes to everybody. And it's, it's serving the masses. And it does serve a purpose. I think that it could be used as a marketing strategy, especially if you're starting out new, to just get your name put out there. Yeah. You utilize each client as an opportunity to figure out, do they have friends? Do they have family? Who else wants to come and see me? But I do feel that once you've been in the industry for more than a year, in my opinion, that it is probably important that you go ahead and you niche down and get into a place that you're getting really specific with the services you love to do. As I mentioned, like, when you do things that you love, when you talk about things that you love, when you're in your element, you shine. Like that's when your magic shines. That's when you start to become a magnet to people and they want to come into your vicinity and they want to spend time and they want to spend money with you. It's the services that I think about that I don't love, for instance, and I'll be quite transparent. Um, I've been really niching down and getting, I'm sorry, getting away from doing men's cuts. I have probably four that I still take care of. I do charge a high ticket for them, so that's probably one reason why I don't do very many, but two, I'm not calling them in. I don't personally find the joy in myself doing men's work, but I do know there are stylists out there that are amazing at it. And I want to refer my clients to those people because they shine bright in that area. They are magnetic within that area. I know where I'm magnetic and I know what makes me really excited when I have a new client that comes in who's getting specific services like extensions and lived in color and I love doing reds. So those are things that light me up. And you have to be okay with saying no. You have to be okay with shifting and pivoting your business. You have to be okay with shedding people that maybe don't serve you anymore, but know for certain that there are more of the people that you want to start seeing and doing available to you in your area. And not to have the mindset that, oh my gosh, if I lose like 10% of my business, I'm, I'm gonna go hungry. Because by letting go of things that don't serve you, you open up space to bring in more people that want to spend that time and money with you that are a better fit and that probably are willing to grow with your business in an even greater way. Yeah, I love that. So there, I guess there's a few different ways to niche down. So you talked about like deciding which services you want to do. Um, and by, you know, getting rid of men's haircuts, you're not serving those men who come in to get their haircut. Maybe by doing, for example, Vivids, you're serving a different type of clientele doing different services. Are there different other ways to niche down in terms of what type of clientele that you get? And if so, can you talk to us about that? I am going to ask you to get more specific on the type of clientele because I definitely can talk about that, but I want to kind of get an idea for what direction we're going with that conversation. 
That's a great question. So I am not the expert when it comes to that, but I think that there's different ways to niche down in terms of maybe demographics or psychographics, or like you said, kind of like more of that soul type of client that you have. Okay. So can you tell us about like some of the ways that maybe you can decide who are the right types of clients for you? Yes, I can. Thank you for, spe or for specifying that. So when it comes to niching down your clientele, I'm going to talk about the soul connection. Yeah. Um, there is a huge movement for inclusivity within our industry. And I definitely want to keep that as a foundation within my business. And I encourage you guys to do the same thing too, right. especially as a hairstylist, when it comes to hair textures and fabrics, that's really what we're looking at. Right. It's not about the person's demographic. It's about what we're working with as a canvas. Now, when it comes to a soul connection, I have a very specific system within my business that they have to step through in order for me to accept them as a client. It's simple, but there are, you'd be surprised how many people don't want to do it. And the people that don't aren't my clientele. So I don't do virtual, I should say, I don't do text message consultations. Right. <laughs> I don't do a consultation without um, seeing the person or even have them do an intake form. So for every new guest that gets referred to me, I have an intake form that has very specific questions on it that essentially is giving me all the information I need to understand who they are, what they want. And through the way that they write and through their responses, I can tell if we're going to be an energetic fit. And then we jump on and do a virtual, so a FaceTime or a, a Zoom call, and then I actually get to meet them. And again, this is all about our connection. So through the questionnaire, I find out if they're a good fit, then we jump on a call and then we dive even deeper. And if I feel there's been a great connection and we're going to jam out, then we go ahead and book the appointment. And then through just knowing myself and knowing how to read people, 80, I'd say like 99% of the time, I'm pretty, I'm pretty on point. There wow. have been times in the past where I have said yes to somebody when I know I should have said no. And that may have been because they didn't fill out the form. I was doing a client's friend a favor. I neglected my systems and it ended up biting me in the butt. They took advantage of my time. They may not have been kind human beings in my business. They had expectations that, or that they weren't listening to what I was saying to them. Like there were definitely big red flags that I have that I just ignored because I was like, well, I'll do this client's friend a favor. And yeah. then and then you ended a good up part. regretting it. So do you recommend that everybody here does an intake form or is it just like we recommend it for a specific type of situation or service? I would say you need any system that's going to allow you to have a filter through your system is going to be beneficial. So for some, it's an intake form. For others, it may be an in-person consultation first. Whatever that looks like for your business and whatever feels best for you, you need to do that. Because some, some beauty professionals don't like computer work. Yeah. And I'm not going to make them love computer work if they don't like it. But there's ways of doing it that's going to allow you to have a filter. And you don't have to say yes to all business. Um, just because somebody refers someone to you doesn't mean that they're energetically a good fit. And you have to know that. And there's ways of saying that you are booked without saying you're not a good fit. So I would always say if for some reason you are working with somebody or you're doing an onboarding process and you're like, you know what, there's too many red flags going on. They're being pushy. They're not yeah. listening to anything that I'm saying. Their, their expectations are way up here. And I know I can't meet them where they're at then you can just say at the moment I have a wait list and when something comes available, I will reach out to you and let you know. But in the meantime, here's a couple people that you can go talk to. <laughs> I love that. So essentially you don't have like a calendar booking app where people can see your availability. They have to do this and take form first. For new clients, yes. Okay. So my onboarding for new clients is very different. For existing clients, they do have the ability to link it to my booking app. And my booking app, I use Vigaro. They have a way, so for instance, if a client that I know has abused the booking app in the past or hasn't been honest with appointments, I can actually turn off the ability for that specific person to not book online. So I have, the, I have control and they have okay. to call me or email me. Awesome. That is such a good idea. In fact, I'm seeing in the comments, um, people are saying they love that. And I'm seeing a few questions. So guys, keep the questions coming for Laura because we're going to do a Q&A in just a bit. Um, so when I was asking you about niching down and figuring out who are those dream clients for you, you said it's not a demographic thing, actually. For me, it's a soul thing. And it seems to me like that is the type of niche niching down that is the best way to go. So can you tell us a little bit about like 
what that has been like like for you at the beginning did you think like oh you know i need to target people who live in a certain area who are like a certain age who have certain interests and then did you end up just kind of changing your mindset around that yes i would say i've taken a handful of courses especially before i started coaching with how to grow your clientele and they all say fill out this form and what is their age and where do they live and how much money do they make and do they have kids and it was just to me it felt overwhelming but I did it and even after I did that and then I was like okay great I know who I'm talking to and then I would reach out to my current clients who fit that ask them for referrals they would bring them they would bring me their friends I was finding that their friends weren't always the greatest fit for me hmm. and just because that their friends were somebody that fit my profile that I created there were definitely things about, I would just say their values, for instance, didn't match my values in the salon. Um, a lot of it was expectations or even just a timeline of like not being respectful of what I do behind the chair. So going back to the stylist that said that she's slow, mm -hmm. I also take my time. I'm not a fast stylist and it's because I create so much value and I have an experience that I do behind the chair that I'm not going to shortchange that just because somebody wants to get in and out fast and I'm a slow hairstylist. Yeah. So for me, I felt almost a little bit bullied by some clients and I had to get really specific on like, why am I feeling this way? It's usually not about you. It wasn't about me. It yeah. was about them and understanding like we just weren't the right fit and it's okay that I don't meet everybody where they're at. I was actually doing a live last night and we were talking about feedback forms, for instance. And feedback forms are really helpful to understand what your clients are wanting more of, less of, getting some information about your business. And one of the ladies I was talking to said, well, I personally don't care that much because I'm not going to change my business model to fit everybody's desires because that's me stepping mm -hmm. away from what's authentic and alignment to my values within my business. So yeah. she'll take the feedback to an extent, but you still have to know for certain who you are, what your values are and stand behind those and be very unapologetic about it, but also, in my opinion, professional about it too. But it's okay to be unapologetic about your values so your business can really grow and thrive. That's what a culture is created on, in all honesty. And if you don't know what your culture is, a core values assessment is like your number one step to kind of start diving into that and understanding what those are. Oh my gosh, I love that. I feel like that's such a that's a very big topic, but I feel like the core values are probably very aligned with like who you are and what you believe in, what your personality is like too. Um, so I don't know if we have time to get into that, but I love that idea of really figuring out what your values are. Um, I wanted to ask you, so you know exactly what type of clients is right for you and which one isn't. So can, do you, can you like break it down how you define your ideal client? Oh man. Okay. This really does come down to an energetic thing. And for me, I think just being a very empathic person, which most of us beauty professionals are, um, I've always had this innate ability to read energy from the beginning. So it's sometimes hard for me to put into words exactly what that means and looks like. I think when it comes down to, I'm going to talk about core values a little bit. So when it comes down to the core values of what my business is and then who's coming in, we don't always have to be like an exact core values match, but they have to be in the same like vicinity of what those are. And for somebody who feels like a good energetic match, um, they're typically going to have the same sense of spiritual connection. So um, that can mean a lot of different things for a lot of different people. It doesn't mean religion, but to me it means like they have a sense of like servant heart. They have a sense of being a good human. They have a sense of giving back. And you can tell a lot by how people speak if it's about them, mm -hmm. if it's all about them, that may not be a great fit. But if they're in a place of they have kids and they're busy and they're doing all these things and they're in all of a sudden like in a servant heart, I'm like, okay, we're going to be a good fit. I can tell that like we're going to jam out on the same topics of discussion yeah. and they're going to understand when I start explaining things to them like where I'm coming from. So it's being like-minded is really what it comes down to. And, and you don't always have to be the exact same human as that person is, but there has to be some type of um, equanimity between yeah. you and your client. So you guys do have a foundation to start and grow from. Um, clients can change though. I will say I've had a client that was newer to me. She had a very different political view and was very forthcoming with that. Um, almost offensive to my assistant. But it was over time of her going through some challenges within her own life that she started to soften. And I started to seeing a different side of her. And I started learning new things about her where we actually finally met on common ground. 
So that's who I'm energetically attracted to. And I think it took her realizing whatever hardship she went through to be like, I need to change. And things started changing between us, which was really nice. So I, I do think that a lot of it really does fall on that type yeah. of principle. Yeah, I love that. Um, once people have figured out who their ideal clients are, they figured out you know who they are, what their values are, what kind of clients they want to get. How do they go about finding more people like this? Because you know, if you've got a huge intake of people who want to book with you and then you can filter them out, then it's, you know, it almost seems in a way easier to have like a booming clientele and like your book is full. But if you're maybe at the starting stages of your business or, you know, you're in a new place or you've changed something about your business, how do you actually go about finding people who can, who you connect with and who you would love to have as clients? That's an awesome question. So seven years, eight years ago, I moved to Dallas and I had no clientele. So I had to be very specific and I was very specific with where I was choosing to position myself to work. So where your salon, where your business, wherever, whatever that industry is, is located is going to be a reflection of you. So I had to make sure that the, the building, for me it was a salon, was going to be a good match. I'm now in a salon suite, but same type of thing. I did my research on where is it located? What is the ambiance like? What is the energy in the room? Are, are the clients that I have right now going to be attracted to this place? Is this going to, again, energetically make sense for me to move here? It's not just about convenience. It's about making sure that this is going to match what I'm building and growing. So once you have that foundation laid down, then you have to really think about, okay, who's going to be coming to this business? So at that time, it was a commission salon. I had to really study who their clientele was, what the age group was, what the people were like. Was everybody a perfect fit? No. And that's going to happen. Even to this day, you're not always going to find the perfect fit, but things will always work themselves out. And that may mean that the client will work themselves out of your business, or that might mean that it will work itself out in some way that you actually end up really enjoying that person. When it comes to really finding your own clientele outside of the, what the business, even just for foot traffic, can provide, I always think about like where would someone that I'm looking for hang out? So if it is social media, are they going to be on Instagram? Are they going to be in a Facebook group? Um, are they going to be a referral from a client? Like who am I going to be really talking to? And I start to speak with my brand voice on that. And by being consistent, which consistency is key. Consistency means months and months on end of speaking in the same brand voice that you would to your person that you're wanting to call in, because it takes about seven times for someone to see something to actually buy into it. Yeah. And you really have to remember that because consistency is queen in this area. You have to be consistent. You have to feel like a broken record. But trust me, by doing that, people are going to start paying attention and they're going to know what to expect from you. It's when you have a brand voice that keeps changing, like you, you keep reaching for all these different clients, hoping that someone's going to catch that people get confused about what you're doing and what you're providing. So I would say number one is to really be consistent and figure out where they hang out. I'm a huge in person. I love meeting people in person versus virtually. So I always look for places to go hang out whether that's at the yoga studio, at a gym, at my local church. Um, maybe it's just getting into a, a place of networking. Um, it doesn't have to be Chamber of Commerce, but there's different. For instance, Dallas has a ton of women's networking events. So I'm going to put myself out there. I'm going to get uncomfortable. I'm going to go meet people in person. I'm going to talk about myself. And even if I don't feel confident, I'm going to dress in my power outfit. <laughs> and I'm going to approach people for the first time and introduce myself and tell them what, it, what I do. Um, through that action, you're going to start feeling more confident and you're going to probably get a lot better feedback than you realize. Oh, I bet. So is that how you started to grow your clientele when you first moved down to Texas? Yeah. Eight years ago, Instagram was not what it was today. And it was a lot of foot traffic. Um, Instagram is a beautiful tool. It does take strategy, but you can utilize that even if it's just to build your portfolio right now. And then also utilizing hashtags for greater reach. You can totally grow a business on Instagram. But I do believe if you're really specific on honing in on your area, um, you can really use a lot of tools. I will say Facebook groups have blown up you can find clients on Facebook groups left and right. Um, that's a really easy way to get clientele, but just know that you're probably gonna weed through some people that match and some people that don't match. So you'll just have to be kind of open-minded to um, who you're calling in. 
Yeah, I love it. I love that you call it calling in because it's really about like magnetizing the right people to you. So final question that I have for you before I go into the comments and see what people are saying about their ideal clients and do some question answer. Um, you said that like your favorite way and your way of building up a clientele at the beginning was in person. So how do you start those conversations? Like it must have been awkward at the beginning. Like what's your icebreaker? How do you approach them? And what do you say about them that doesn't get them to say like, who's this person who's trying to like sell me her services kind of thing? Super awkward. I, I was the most awkward human ever. Um, that's okay. So that's one of my things I talk about. I'm awkward, you know, right? I'm a Canadian. I'm living in the States. I've got like really white skin. Like I play my weird quirkiness up. So when I was actually having to, I'm going to go back to looking for a hair model when I started at my first commission salon here in Texas. And they said, find somebody and come back tomorrow. And I said, I don't know anybody. And they said, well, there's a mall like a mile down the road. I said, okay. So I took business cards. I went to the mall. I literally approached strangers and I said, hi, I know this is really weird, but I'm a new hairdresser in the area. I'm looking for a model that I need for a color tomorrow. Uh, would you be interested in being my model? So that was literally how I started to talk about myself. And once I kind of once I did that for the entire day and I found somebody, thank goodness, I actually continued doing that because I didn't know anybody. So whether I was, like I mentioned, I love doing yoga, whether I was at yoga or whether I was out shopping, um, wherever I was, if I saw someone that had really beautiful hair, I would always go up and compliment them first. You have gorgeous hair. I just wanted to introduce myself. I'm a new stylist in the area. Um, if ever you're looking for a new hairdresser, I would love to serve you. Here's a business card. And then there'd always be some type of um, like percentage or free blow dry, whatever it may be. And I was just very fearless with putting myself out there in that way. And of course I got looks and people were like, well, who's this girl? I didn't care because like, I had nothing to lose at that point. All I needed was clientele to grow my business. And I was being very specific because I came to Dallas with 11 years experience at that time. And I wanted to grow an extension business. And I didn't want to have it filled with stuff that I didn't love doing. So I got super, super specific on being the extension specialist. Um, I created a Facebook page for what my area is called Frisco, Texas. So Frisco, Texas hair extensions. And everything that I put out there was about hair. Like I was almost like word vomiting hair all over my social media the best that I could. So people knew like that's what I was doing. Yeah. And through that, I grew a clientele and I still have the client that was my first model as a client to date, um, my longest time client here in Texas, and she's been amazing the entire time. That's amazing. That is such good advice, Laura. And it just goes to show that you don't just have to rely on social media and all of that for growing a clientele, like how you act in person and like who you approach and that kind of thing can make a huge difference too. So thank you for that. Thank you again, Laura. Um, one final thing, if people want to connect with you, they can find you on Instagram at I am Laura Elizabeth. And then um, if they want to learn more from you, how else could they work with you? So I am going to be launching my next group coaching program in August and it starts in September. So that's going to be, it's actually called the Glass Ceiling Academy. It is designed for hairstylists. Um, but I would be open to having other beauty professionals in there because it's not just going to be catering to what hairdressers do. We talk about evolution of business, scalability, increasing revenue, and then even stepping beyond what you do behind your business and wanting to get into mentorship and leadership as well too. So it is an all-encompassing program where you get one-on-one -on -one with me as well a group atmosphere. Um, and then I do one-on-one -on -one coaching uh, that's an accelerated program where we go in, we go hard, we get Within three months, we get a lot of work done. So that's also um, available as an option too. Um, but you can always slide into my DMs. That's probably the best way to get the conversation yeah. started if that sounds like a good fit. I love it, amazing. Well, thank you again so much, Laura. I've learned so much and I know everybody else has started to get really, really clear on who they are, who they're for, and really what makes them special and how to connect with those people who just get you.